Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my final verdict on the Samyang AF 35mm f1.4. And this is for Sony FE, or full frame mirrorless. This is, I believe, the fourth of uh, Samyang's autofocusing lens for the Sony platform. And the last one that I reviewed was the 50 millimeter f1.4. And I did that towards the beginning of this year. I can say safely that this uh, lens has made huge strides since that lens, both in the optical performance but also in the autofocus performance and the behavior of the autofocus system. We're going to break down that autofocus behavior a little bit more in today's episode. But right now, let's jump in and let's take a look at a few other things. First of all, if you haven't already, I would recommend that you look at my first look episode where I break down the build and the handling in detail. I won't go into that uh, for the sake of time today much, but I want to highlight just a few things. This is a great looking lens. Um, it is kind of a minimalist type design. There are no switches. There's nothing on the lens barrel itself other than the manual focus ring and then a red accent ring, which gives it a quite a sleek and modern looking appearance. It has got a nice grade of build that seems to have some metal alloys in the actual lens barrel itself. It is based on a metal mount. And unfortunately, it does not have any kind of weather sealing. And so if you're really, really fixated on having that, note that your best weather sealing is going to come with the Sony Zeiss 35mm f1.4 Distagon, but you're going to pay for it. And then also, um, Sigma has added a tiny modicum of um, weather sealing, basically in just adding a, a gasket to the rear mount um, on the, the FE version of the Sigma 35mm f1.4 art lens. I doubt it's a whole lot different than this, but you are getting a gasket at the lens barrel. So anyway, that's just something to bear in mind when it comes to that. This is not a small lens. It's physically quite large and um, you know relatively heavy. It's, it's not really lighter at all than what the Sony Zeiss version is. And it is going to be lighter than the Sigma version. The Sigma is going to be the largest and the heaviest here, but it's not a whole lot smaller than uh, that lens either. And so you're, you're getting a substantial lens. However, as you can see, it fits fine on the camera. It balances fine. And, and I haven't had any issues in use. I actually like using it in a lot of ways. I do miss the fact, um, you know, a couple of features that the Sony Zeiss has that this doesn't is one is an autofocus um, on or off, you know, autofocus, manual focus switch. There's no switches on here, as I noted, which means that you're going to uh, need to go into the camera and you know set it up in some way. Like I have it, you know, mapped to a certain function where I can switch between autofocus and manual focus. And so doing so raises a second thing that people are not crazy about that I'm not crazy about, and that is that the manual focus ring, while it's it's good for making quick um, adjustments, I do find that if I am make, trying to make small and finite adjustments that the damping is not quite precise enough there. And so it is a little bit of a struggle sometimes to get to that perfect autofocus point. And so it's not the best executed manual focus ring that I've ever used before, but it, it does work. And of course, you know, the image will magnify, you know, all of those things do help for getting the right thing. It's just the feel is not as, as great as some lenses that I have used. 67 millimeter uh, filter thread up front. And in terms of the other functionality, it does pretty much everything that you would want it to do. Now, let's talk about autofocus here for a few moments. Obviously, this is, uh, this is at the heart of what Samyang is working at right now. They have been known for making manual focus lenses in the past. And so in just the last couple of years, they've started to develop autofocus lenses. So they are, in a sense, playing catch up when it comes to this um, area of lens design compared to some other manufacturers. And that was quite obvious to me in the 50 millimeter f1.4 that had a rather coarse and buzzy sounding focus motor and uh, also just it didn't have as polished of behavior as the two uh, Sony Zeiss lenses that I was comparing it to, the 50 millimeter f1.4 and the 55 millimeter f1.8. Fortunately, I see a lot of match saturation um, in that time since in this lens here, in that in the autofocus performance when it comes to um, 
you know, a single shot mode. It focuses uh, quiet. It focuses quickly. Um, a, a big improvement when it comes to that. Autofocus seems to be quite confident in most situations. And in single shot mode, I think that they've, it's really, really made a huge amount of progress. Now, I should note that autofocus is somewhat of a moving target with these Samyang lenses because they're, they're kind of continuing to develop on the fly. So th the upside is, is that they have made significant improvements to autofocus performance through firmware updates. And so um, this, I'm using the most recent version. This is a firmware update three or version three, which means that already since release in, in less than a year's time, they have done two firmware updates that have made uh, ongoing improvements to things like IAF and autofocus performance. Now, the one downside when it comes to that is that to get those firmware updates, you're going to need their lens station, which here in North America can be somewhat hard to source for whatever reason. You can probably find it on eBay, and, and I'll see if I can throw a link to it and a retailer under the description down below. But I know from myself that looking for it earlier on, it's, it's not always the easiest thing to find. And unfortunately, firmware updates, for whatever reason, can't be um, uploaded through uh, just a, a packet through the camera body, like in the case of some of the Sony lenses and Sigma lenses for that matter, other lenses like that. And so anyway, you do need that lens station, but it's probably worth investing in if you're going to buy this lens or maybe even considering buying a few of their lenses because it'll allow you to get that ongoing development and hopefully continually improving autofocus performance. Now, things are a little less rosy when you switch over into AFC mode. Um, in a lot of ways, the, the camera still focuses quite well in terms of focus speed. There's a little bit more noise, and that noise is more because, at least with the lens I tested, it can't seem to really settle in AFC on any point and stick with it. And so it's always doing tiny little micro adjustments. And so there's just a little bit of noise that is always being created. Fortunately, it's not loud and buzzy or it'd be really distracting as it was with the 50 millimeter F1.4. In this case, the focus motor is much quieter and smoother, but there is still that kind of constant little micro pulse adjusting that is taking place. You'll also notice that when it comes to video performance, that video um, AF, as you can see from this, it's, it's really not bad if you're in a situation where your actually focus needs to change to some degree. But I did find that in some of the situations where I've used it for some of my static episodes like I'm doing right here, that the, the, it would sometimes do a little bit of hunting, you know, or defocus for no good reason. It's like it, it always is looking for the better focus and sometimes it nails it and sometimes it blows it. But uh, as I said, it's a work in progress, but I did find that my autofocus accuracy was very good in AFS mode and typically in AFC mode as well, but sometimes those little micro pulses would throw it off just a little bit. And so something to be aware of there. When it came to IAF, it actually works quite well for detecting eyes, tracking eyes, and it does well with that. But I did get a few quirk behaviors that I'll try to quickly delineate for you here. I noted that in doing an actual um, little portrait shoot early on with the lens when I was still trying to get a sense of it, that in using AFC and IAF that I got less precise results than what I typically like. And so I thought I'd try to track that down. And so I did first a test where I put this on a tripod. I used AFC and IAF and I defocused in between and I compared it to the, um, I don't have the Sony Zeiss 35 millimeter, but I do have the Sony Zeiss 50 millimeter. And so I compared it to that. Well, what I found is that both lenses in that situation, they did essentially a perfect job, as you can see in every frame of focusing on the eye and doing accurate focus odd. So why did I get such varied results there? And so then I, I tried to shoot some subsequent tests. And so in one of those tests, I, um, I turned, I had steady shot on. And what I did in this test, I used AFC and IAF, but I had my subject move around in between shots, trying different, you know, kind of positions. Um, with with her face and what I found is that my um, my keeper rate dropped way down like I wasn't happy with that But because I had had a little bit of an inkling about this I did the same test again, but I turned off um, Steady shot for that sequence 
And what I found is while it still wasn't as good as when I shot off of the tripod and the subject stayed mostly still, um, what I did find is that my keeper rate went up to about 70%. And so, you know, kind of split the difference between the two. So that might be worth experimenting for you on your own, and it may be copy specific as well. But just note that AFC mode, and the thing is, is I know from talking to Sam Yang in engineers that they know about some of the, you know, the, the seeking and hunting a little bit in AFC mode, and they are working at developing, and there is a fourth version of the firmware that will be coming out in the future. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to get continually good performance when it comes to that. I will note that while I haven't yet personally directly compared them, a lot of people that have, have found that the performance between this lens and you know, the Sony Zeiss 35 millimeter is not incredibly different. I also know from reviewing uh, several of the art series, um, or I should say FE versions of Sigma art series lenses, that they have their own quirks in some situations um, with hunting and, and so, you know, byproduct of that is that I think that you'll probably get a little bit better auto autofocus performance right now with the Sony Zeiss, but I don't think it's going to be incredibly different. And I don't think you're going to get really much better autofocus performance out of the Sigma 35 millimeter F1.4 art. Though I do hope to compare all three of these lenses at some point in the future and be a little bit more definite about that. And so autofocus performance, work in progress, but really pretty good at this point and a whole lot better than the 50 millimeter f1.4. Now in a subsequent episode, I broke down the image quality in detail and I'll just give you a recommendation and that is check out the image gallery and the images down below um, that you can see by cl clicking through that link. What I did before I, you know, what made me really interested in this lens is that I did look at a lot of photos from it, say like in Flickr galleries uh, from, you know, people that were using the lens because a lot of times I get a sense of whether or not the, the rendering actually appeals to me and it did. And so I was interested in this lens and after doing some thorough testing of it, I remain interested in it. Now I can compared it to what I had on hand, which is what I consider to be the best 35, or at least autofocusing 35 millimeter f1.4 lens out there, which is the Canon EF 35 millimeter f1.4 L Mark II. And I've compared that to a number of lenses, including the, you know, Sigma 35 art, and um, it, it, it just comes out on top. Now, I did compare it to the Zeiss Milvus 35 millimeter f1.4, a gorgeous lens. And I think that the, the Zeiss has a little bit better rendering and a little bit bokeh quality, but uh, the, the Canon actually proved to be the sharper lens of the two in comparing them. So I say that to say, I put this up against really the best benchmark I think out there and also one that costs, you know, over three times as much as this lens. So, I mean, it's maybe not a fair comparison, but that's the comparison I made. What I found is that the uh, the Canon was a little bit sharper wide open, particularly in the edges of the frame. It also has a little bit better wide open contrast because chromatic aberrations are better controlled. It doesn't have hardly any longitudinal chromatic aberrations at all. And so it has amazing wide open contrast and sharpness. The Samyang was really not all that far behind, however, and once we stopped down to about f2.8 and smaller, they really behaved more similarly than different and um, produced incredibly detailed, incredibly sharp images. However, this lens, I want you to know, it, it can produce really great looking images even at f1.4. Like I said, there's a little bit of green fringing in some situations, but contrast, while not at the supreme level of the Canon, is really very good. And as a byproduct of that, you can get some really crisp looking images at f1.4. And truth of the matter is, is that in many cases, unless I told you what lens took the shot, there's a good chance that you wouldn't be able to guess which is which. And so it's a pretty strong performance when it comes to that. It also has very nice bokeh quality um, in a lot of situations. I will note that um, if you're using like really bright lights, like I did some kind of Christmas tree type shots, Christmas lights, and I found there I discovered it does have some concentric rings and bokeh highlights, sometimes referred to as onion bokeh. And um, and so, I mean, that definitely is an issue if you shoot a lot of those type of shots. I'm not crazy about that look. It's busy to me. 
However, for you know 98% of what I shot, I hadn't noticed that at all. I actually found the bokeh quality to really be quite good in other type situations. So you may just need to evaluate based on what you actually shoot with the lens. It's certainly capable of producing some really stunning images, and I've had some very popular ones that I've shared out of this lens already. And so, in conclusion, you really are getting a lot of value for money when it comes to this lens. The Sony's ICE is, you know, typically around $1,500 in the U.S. market. And uh, while this lens has an MSRP of around $800, you can typically find it, you know, somewhere closer to the, you know, six or $700 range, which makes it a pretty huge value when you compare it. And I know that in some markets, like in Europe, it comes in at closer to a third of the price of the Sony Zeiss lens. And of course, that Sony Zeiss lens is not without its own flaws. And a number of people have noted issues with some decentering, which I saw a little bit in my copy here, not hugely destructive, just a little, little minor, but um, you know, there's, there's some quality control issues there with the Sony as well. And of course, it's a whole lot harder to excuse with such an expensive lens as a you know, really very well-priced one like this. I, I'm a sucker for 35 millimeter wide aperture lenses. If I had to be stuck with only one focal length, God forbid, I would probably choose a 35 millimeter f1.4. I feel like you can do pretty much everything with it. If it has a decent magnification, uh, you can get in close and do fine art shots where you you know create a very defocused background. I think that's great. You can jump out and do environmental portraits or events, and they do great for that. And then of course you can also shoot landscapes or city with them. And so there's just a lot of things that a 35 millimeter f1.4 lens does very well. And I think that. A a lot of people will find this to be a fairly indispensable addition to their kit. You pair this with a good 85 millimeter lens, for example, and you have a two lens solution that can really do a lot of stuff with really great image quality. If you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my written review. As already mentioned, you can also find a link to that image gallery. And there are some buying links there if you'd like to purchase one for yourself. And of course, as always, buying through those links does help to support this channel, or you can choose to directly support by becoming a patron. You can sign up for my newsletter and stay up to date with all of the reviews and giveaways information there. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.